Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. I'll be reading from the ESV. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. We are uh, going through... Uh, the Emotionally Healthy Spirituality series uh, as a course, but also uh, during our worship together. And then today, and then we are at the topic, uh, the, how you and I, we are encouraged to grow uh, emotionally, a uh, mature person in loving other people. Uh, the parable of Good Samaritan is perhaps the, the best well-known parable. And then if you stop anybody, and then they will tell you, hey, what is this about? And said, oh, it's about helping people who are in need. It's about, uh, uh, you know, somebody uh, who was robbed as they were going, you know, that he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. And uh, because he was in need, stripped of all things, and half dead, and lying in some place, in a, in a seemingly dangerous place, the priest went by, but then stepped aside, and and then didn't go, and then helped, and then Levites came by, and then didn't care to come to look and to help, but it was Samaritan uh, people, somebody uh, that uh, Jewish people did really despised and did not like, and then came by, and then and got involved, and then took action, and then helped that person, and then, yeah, that's the wonderful story, and then that's you know, what a Christian is supposed to be in loving God and loving other people. And that's kind of the general picture of how people uh, understand. But Jesus says, go do likewise. And then Jesus said, this is a, a command. You know, many times uh, people, I included, uh, think of this Good Samaritan uh, passage and command to love others uh, as an option. Like, yeah, I'm doing my best serving small group and I'm participating, but that do I really have to, you know, be kind to people uh, that are not nice to me? And do I really have to put up with these people? Do I really have to love them? And we often think of it as an option. But, you know, as we go back to this passage and as we look at this uh, a story one more time, and then uh, a story one more time. And then we see there is some important truths that you need to wrestle with as we think about, you know, Jesus' command that you not only need to love God, but love others. And then how are you going to be a good neighbor to other people? And before you leave, you need to think about this because that's what God's word for today is speaking to you. And speaking to me. You know the story. That's just the story that I told you about. But that there is a prior story. 
And then prior story that starts with verse 25 and down is like this. And there was a lawyer. It's not a typical lawyer that uh, sues for divorce uh, lawsuit, but it, it's a lawyer who is a, a teacher of the law. So he's a Bible teacher and he is a theologian. And then he came here, the word says, to test Jesus, to put him in a trap and ask the question, Oh, teacher, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's very interesting. And then he didn't say, what must I do to earn eternal life? But then he said, what must I do to inherit? You know, what, how do you inherit something? And you have to become a, a part of the family to inherit, to receive the inheritance. But, but that's what he says. And then Jesus uh, answers and then with a question, what does the scripture say? What does the Bible say? You know what it says. How do you read it? And then his response was, well, you know, we all know it. We recite it in the morning and in the evening every day. And then everybody knows it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says, good, you do it, and then you will live. You know, in this uh, interaction, and before Jesus begins to teach about and talk about this story and the parable of Good Samaritan, there are some important things that you need to wrestle with. You know, what do you think? The question that the teacher asked, what do you need to do, or how would you inherit eternal life? What is your answer? How would you respond to that question? This is a, such an important question. How would you do that? You know, if you were to die today, you know, how would you be able to go to heaven? You know, what is your answer? And you better have an answer to this question. And Jesus said, go to the Bible. What does the Bible say? You know, there was another guy that came with a similar question and said, Oh, a good teacher, how should I, what should I do, and how can I inherit this eternal life? And Jesus, why do you call me good? And then do and keep the commandment and this young rich ruler and said, Oh, I've been keeping all those things as soon as I was young. I've been keeping the first commandment, second commandment, third, fourth, fifth, all of them. And then Jesus uh, and then and looked at him, good, good. And but Jesus wanted to push a little bit more. And then Jesus asked the question. Oh, by the way, you said you've been keeping first commandment and there is no other thing. And God is your number one and only one, right? Then, if that is the case, why don't you sell all your possessions and come follow me? And then he walked away feeling very, 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 very sad and sorrowful because the things he had, he had a lot of stuff and possessions. And then possessions that he had really was an idol that took place of God. Here, Jesus, in a sense, put this teacher in a trap too. You know about loving. Yes, love God. Do that. And then you will be able to live forever. But you know what? If you really... <laughs> know what the Bible teaches. Yes, Bible gives this commandment. But, but Bible also uh, reminds and then helps us to see there is nobody who is able to keep all these things in a perfect way. You know, the Bible says, yes, you need to keep all these laws, but that these laws that reflect God's character, and then you come to realize you can't now keep all these things, and then, and, but how can you uh, go to be together with God forever? And then what you do is you come to God and say, God, I can't do this. I can't do this. And then have mercy. And then as he or she comes, and then, and then honestly bring before God, 
God, I can't love you with all of my heart. I cannot think of you. I cannot love you with 100% of my mind, 100% of my strength. I can't. I just can't do this. Have mercy. And then we see the scripture that speaks so much about God's provision of forgiveness and mercy. The whole system of sacrifice. Yes, a sinner comes and then receives God's mercy. So that they are brought to a relationship together with God. You see, Jesus was putting him in a trap. What does the Bible elsewhere teach us? You know, we go to New Testament, Ephesians 2, chapter 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith, right? And then you cannot save yourself, not by your work, not through anything else, but by faith, receiving the grace because of what God has done for you. That you know, you and I know. So there is nobody in heaven. And then because of what you have done, that you will be there. But then... Put that on a hold a little bit, and let's go to Matthew 25. And then when Jesus comes back in the second coming, and then he's going to bring all the people before him. And then as he is going to judge, here, chapter 25, and then verses 34, it reads this way. Then the king will say to those on the right, come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink, and I was stranger, and then you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me, and I was sick, and then you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Enter into the Master's joy and enter into God's kingdom. That's what he's saying. But then, verse 37, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you? And then, or thirsty and give you drink? And then, when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? Or naked and close you? And then, when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto you, as much as what you have done to the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. Here, truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you have done it unto me. And then he sends all these people that have been doing the work of loving and being a good neighbor into heaven. So you need to pause here and think about this. What is this? What is this? We heard and Jesus was speaking and then that nobody can go to heaven. But it sounds like if you volunteer a lot for local justice missions, that you go to heaven. Or that you help a lot of people or your job is a social worker. It seems like you have a highly, you know, higher percentage of a possibility going to heaven because you're paying attention to these people. Is that what it is? Is that what Jesus is saying? How do we reconcile the, the two? You know, there was other place where Jesus was speaking about the judgment. And Jesus says, by the tree, the fruit that you will tell the tree, whether it's a good tree or bad tree. You know, if you look at the tree, how can you tell whether this is a good tree? And by the leaves that it produces and the fruits that it produces. And then the other one, there's no leaves. And then no sign of any fruit. And then anything that looks like a fruit is not a good fruit. That means... The tree is bad. With that in mind, go back to this service and ministry and kindness to other people. You see, there's nobody that will go to heaven except those that have received the gift of eternal life through the act of God's mercy and grace. But how can you tell that you are 
as somebody that received God's grace and then have a gift of eternal life and then you are a child of God. Except by the fruit of your life. You know, you need to pause here and think about this for some time. I'm not saying, oh, I've been serving faithfully, Sunday school, praise, or doing a lot of other things. I do a lot of stuff for the church. No, 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 no. You know, Jesus is not particularly looking for activities that you do, but Jesus is noticing the evidence of life, evidence of mercy, evidence of grace that has transformed your life And that is bearing fruit in your life, through your life, touching the lives of other people. Friends, you need to pause and think about this. One day when you will stand before God, He's not going to say, hey, how many times you accepted Jesus? No, He doesn't have to answer a question. He will see the evidence and fruits of your life, whether you are his, that you are his children, that you are his servants and followers, or you're just religious people. Let this sink in. There's another thing that we want to just think about. As we look at the story of the the Good Samaritan, you know, what's the difference? Priests were the people that knew the Bible well, and then they were not only helping people experience God's mercy, right, through sacrifice, but also these were the people that were teaching the Bible too. Oops. (laughs) These were the people that were teaching the Bible about God's law, the justice, and then how we are to live as God's people. Levites, other people, they were leaders of local justice ministry and they were the ones that were giving out the, 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 the food and the, the things that the poor people uh, needed. And these were the people that were involved in the, the ministry. But then, they didn't care to stop when they saw a person in need and they passed by. Except the Good Samaritan. Good Samaritan stopped. And then the difference here, this passage is speaking about, and then it records this way. Luke 10, it records this way. But verse 33, when a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and then when he saw this man in need, he had compassion. He had compassion. And then he went to him and then bound up his wounds and poured on oil and wine. And then he set the man on his own animal donkey and then brought him to an inn and then took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and then gave them to the innkeeper. Take care of him. Whatever you may spend, I will repay you when I come back. You know, the the main difference is not just what he did, but the first thing, first reaction here, when he saw that man in need, he had compassion. And then this is it. This is a secret. He had compassion that made him respond to a person in need. And this is the key. You know, we're not talking about, yes, you got to do more things. You got to volunteer more. You got to help out people more. No, we're not talking about actual doing things, but that actual doing needs to come out of what you have in you, out of your being, and being a loving person, and then out of the, you having a heart of a love and compassion for people, And then you live that out and then be a neighbor that Jesus is talking to you about. How does this work? We need to take a step back and then think about 
this together. What's this compassion? It's the emotion that describes Jesus the most. Jesus, when he saw of people uh, that were harassed, and Jesus said, compassion on them. When Jesus saw people and they were oppressed, Jesus had compassion on them. He was moved with pain inside. And then he was feeling their hurts and then he was moving. But then this is very similar also to, you know, God's Love in the Old Testament of how God who had love and kindness, mercy upon people that were sinners and people that belonged to him but who continued to go astray. God who having mercy and kindness, you know, upon people that are undeserving. And it speaks about God's covenantal love. And that is what the word here is speaking about. Here. This good Samaritan had this compassion. But then remember earlier on, if we go back, and then Jesus asked, hey, what are the, the greatest command, uh, commandment? What is the Lord required in the scripture? Oh, love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, all your strength and mind, and love your neighbor. Okay, going to love your neighbor. How can you love? You cannot love unless you have the compassion for the neighbors. But how can you have this compassion for the neighbors? It's not how to talk to people. It's not how to lift up other people's burden. No, having this compassion for other people that you're feeling sick and you're feeling the pain and then you just feel like, oh, you know, this person is in the same situation I am, what I have gone through, and then I just cannot help but to, you know, just identify together this compassion. How do you have this compassion? But that is connected to as you grow in loving God, God begins to touch your heart and enlarge it and then put His love so that you begin to Look at people differently. You begin to experience God's love in you reaching out to people. How do you grow as you receive more and more and more of God's love in you? As you learn to grow in response to God and say, God, there is nobody that loves like you do. And then you know all my faults and our brokenness and pain and shame and guilt. And you still love me, accepted me. And then you call me your beloved. And then you love me, you forgave me, you accept me. And there is nobody that loves like you do. And God, thank you for that love. And then God, you are continuing to love me, pouring your love upon my life more and more and more and more. And God, I love you. I love you. I love you. There is nobody that is more important. Loving you is more important than my life. And then as you learn to grow in response to that love, you begin to experience your heart being in love with his love, touching and transforming you, begin to see people, begin to identify, begin to love them. Friends, this is very important thing. We're not just talking about you need to sign up more for local justice mission. By the way, we have an outreach signed up, and then the dates all are there. So much more than you coming and doing service and thinking, yeah, I've done it. I did it. No, forget that. But before doing that, it's so important that you have a heart that has compassion. How can you unless you experience God's compassion for you? How do you do it? That you come to God. You come to God. You come to God through God's word and then honestly come to God and say, God, here I am. I am a broken person. I am a mess. 
I don't even like myself. But then you hear God whisper his words of love in times of prayer that you feel his touch and embrace. During time of worship that you feel him lifting up your burden. And then as you have time opening God's word, God, I don't know how to live my life. I don't know what to do. And then God coming and then appearing and showing his presence that he's with you. God, I'm going to such a, a depressing thing. What do I do? And then you begin to feel in the midst of same thing that you're going through, that his presence with you, helping you to see, hey, I'm with you. I'm holding your hand. We're going to walk through this thing together. And then you experience God. And then you have a deepening personal relationship with God where you are growing in knowing and experiencing his love, but learning to love him more and more and more. Not just two hours church on Sunday, but you start the day with him, walk with him, begin to say, thank you, God, for that meeting. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And begin to see that God is with you all through your life. And then as you respond to him more and more and more, you grow deeper and deeper, deeper in his love. And then as you grow deeper, deeper, you begin to able to embrace other people more and more and more and more. You know, Jesus, uh, how did he practice uh, this, uh, the growing deeper of uh, with uh, God the Father. Remember, in the midst of a toughest time and then wilderness. And then as uh, he was preparing to go right before, and then God the Father, and you are my beloved, in whom I am well pleased. And then he was driven into the wilderness. But that's where he was. Nobody around. But he was together with God the Father. As he was doing the ministry, what did he do early in the morning before he met anybody, did anything, and then he was out to spending time together with the Father, deepening, receiving the Father's love, deepening his response of love, and then out of that, reaching out to other people. You know, friends, uh, this is such a simple Yet, very important. You cannot say, oh, I need to love God with all my heart. Yeah, I got to do more. I got to do more. I got to do. No, you can't. God is a person. And then your love for him is a relational and personal. And then you need to experience him more. And then you need to respond to him more as you grow more and more. That's the second thing. You need to have a heart of compassion that is developed as you grow deeper as a person of love, as you grow deeper, growing as God's beloved. There's one more thing that we want to pay attention, and that is this. An example of this Samaritan, good Samaritan person. You know, as we think about, you know, we could very easily, this is a simpler uh, thing. What did he do? And then with his compassion, he took notice because he was seeing people the way God was seeing people. As people that are precious, made in the image of God. People that are broken and people that are messed up, but not the way that they were supposed to be. 
They were created as God's image in the goodness. But the effect of sin marred and then made them broken with all that oppression and pain. But then, and with God's eyes, and then Jesus sees, and because he has come with God's mercy to bring about change and then bring about hope and grace that could touch and make a difference. That's what was happening here. He got involved and then became inconvenienced. Oh, I have so much to do. I don't have time. No. You know, our job for you and me is not just about doing our job well. Our even prior work is that you and I are put here, not just so that you will do your work well, so that you will become f- successful. But then one day when you stand before God, and it's going to be about people, because people last forever. People that you meet are eternal. But the thing that you work on, that do not last as long. And then you learn to put your agenda on the side a, a little bit for God's interruption so that you can pay attention to people that God has his eyes on. And then as you do what you can, what you're really doing is through what God has gifted you as you are serving, showing kindness that you have experienced in Jesus Christ, that you are really extending God's mercy, God's kindness, God's love. And then God's love extends through you to touch and make those people encounter God's mercy. Friends, third part, I think it's also important because it reminds you and me that when Jesus says, you go, do likewise. And that it seems like Jesus is not saying that this is an option for you. And then if you are a small group leader or if you've been active at church for 15 years or more, you need to do this. But the Jesus is saying, if you have experience, if your lives have been touched by the mercy of God and compassion of God, and if you know something about God's gift of eternal life, you have it. And then from now on, you live it and share. Good Samaritan is a picture of Jesus that has come, bringing God's mercy. And Jesus says, you too have experienced the mercy of God. And you too start the day knowing that you are here because God put you here. You and your identity, you're created by God. Sinned and broken but then redeemed by God's grace. Spirit of God living inside of you and then living with eternal hope and inheritance. Living today a mission with Jesus so that together with you, that Jesus will continue to extend his love to so many that are broken and that are in need. You need to, and you are to, be people that are living with a new purpose, new calling. You know, a couple of weeks ago, and then some of our pastors went to a a, KGMA left. You know, Dr. Nelson Jennings came and then uh, uh, shared a little bit about uh, that and then it was a uh, Korean globally mission leaders uh, forum and then there other many mission leaders came and uh, spoke about different things but there was uh, one particular person and then he's an 87 year old pastor who retired 17 years ago but then he's keep doing 
uh, the things about encouraging people for mission. And he said, I was interviewing him. And then I said, hey, um, Pastor Lee, uh, tell me how you started, you know, your church, uh, you know, many, many years ago. He says, you know, I was studying and learning more about oh, God's plan of mission in the Bible. And then I realized that, you know, this mission is something that is not an option. It's something that we cannot escape. This is uh, you know, God's mission. Uh, this is on God's heart and that sent Jesus to come and die for. So we need to take this seriously. So in his church, what he did was, you know, he's giving 70% of their budget, okay, to support missionaries. And so if your child is on uh, a first grade, a first grade Sunday school kids, they're praying for uh, uh, Iran, or some other country. And then youth group, high school, junior high kids, uh, they're praying for another country. So in the, con you know, the church, there are 200 plus prayer groups for 200 plus different countries. And then, and then people that grew up their church and says, Pastor Lee told us every Sunday, you're a missionary. We're all missionaries. Missions is not something that few people that go, you know, until no. You and I are sent here on mission. Do not waste your life. Do not waste your time. You need to live with mission. And take the gospel. Reach out. Tell people so that they can have eternal life. That's available for them. You know, I was really challenged. All of his four children serving in the mission field. But then he was saying to all the pastors and leaders, what better thing is there? When you join God on his mission, when God uses you, and your prayer, your time, and your service so that person who are broken, no hope, find hope and become God's children and live eternally. What better thing is there? Friend, Today's message, this time around as I was preparing and then studying and meditating, it just took me and it's taking us much, much, much deeper. I started out saying, you, living as a good neighbor is not an option. You and I are to live on mission with God, joining his mission so that through you that God will bring many that are broken, that are in need, who are dead in sin and transgression so that they will become God's children forever. Let us pray. Would you just take a short time to think and listen to what one thing the Lord may be whispering to you? How can you inherit eternal life? Oh, by faith in Jesus Christ. But then, how do people know that you really do have faith? except that has been expressed and grown and then evidence born fruit in loving kindness and service to people that are in need. 
Are you growing as a, a neighbor? Do you have compassion? Are you growing in loving relationship with God? Is God and His love real and personal in your life? If not, if you're not growing there, you're not really going to love people with God's love. Jesus is inviting you, reminding you if you have experienced the mercy of God. Live the way that God has treated you and then extended His grace to you. Do what God has done to you to others. Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name.